Hi, everybody. We're here at Veeamon 2022. This is day two of the Cube's continuous coverage. I'm Dave Vellante. My co-host is Dave Nicholson. A lot, ton of energy. The, the keynotes, day two keynotes are all about products at Veeam. Veeam, the color of green, <laughs> same color as money. And so, and it flows in this ecosystem. I'll tell you right now, Michael Cade is here. He's the senior technologist for product strategy at Veeam. Michael, fresh off the keynotes. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> um, Danny Allen's keynote was fantastic. I mean, that story he told blew me away. I can't wait to have him back. Stay tuned for that one. But we're going to talk about protecting containers, Kasten. You got, uh, got announcements of Kasten by Veeam, you call it, K10 version 5, I think. Yeah, so just rolled into 5.0 release this week. Now, it's a bit different to what we see some, from a uh, VBR release cycle kind of thing, because we're constantly working on a two-week sprint cycle. So as much as 5.0's been launched and announced, we're going to see that trickling out over the next couple of months until we get round to KubeCon NA and we do all of this again, right? So, so let's back up. I first bumped into Kasten, I, I, gosh, it was several years ago at a, a, a Vima. I'm like, wow, this is a really interesting company. I had deep conversations with them. They had a Cheshire cat grin, like something was going on. And okay, finally, you acquire them, but go back a little bit of history. Why, like, why the need for this? Containers are, were used to be ephemeral. You, you know, you didn't have to persist them. That changed, but but you guys are way ahead of that that trend. Talk a little bit more about the history there, and then we'll get into current day. Yeah, I think the the need for stateful workloads within Kubernetes has absolutely grown. I think we just saw 1.24 of Kubernetes get released last week, and or a couple of weeks ago now. And, and really the focus there, you can see at least three of the big ticket items in that release are focused around storage and data. So it just encourages that the community is wanting to put these data services within that. But it's also common, right? We're, it's great to think about a stateless, if you've got a stateless application, but even a web server's got some state, right? Every, there's always going to be some data associated to an application. And if there isn't, then gr like, great, but that doesn't really work. No, like but you're that. right, where'd they click? Where'd they go? I mean, little things like that, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So one of the things that we're seeing from that is like, obviously the, the requirement to back up and putting a lot of data services in there and taking full like, um, like exposure of the Kubernetes ecosystem, HA and very tiny containers versus these, these large um, like virtual machines that we, We've always had the story at Veeam around the portability and being able to move them left, right, here, there, and everywhere. But from a K10 point of view, the ability to not only protect them, but also move those applications or move that data um, wherever they need to be. Okay, so, and Kubernetes, of course, has evolved. I mean, in the early days of Kubernetes, they kept it simple, kind of like Veeam, actually, right? And yeah. then, you know, even though Mesosphere and even Docker uh, Swarm, they were trying to do more sophisticated cluster management. Kubernetes has now got projects getting much more complicated. So, more complicated workloads mean more data. More critical data means more protection. Okay, so you acquire Kasten. We, we know that's a sm small part of your business today, but it's going to be growing. We, we, we know this because everybody's developing applications. So what's different about protecting containers? Danny talks about Modern data protection, okay. When I first heard that, I'm like, eh, nice tagline. But then he, he peeled the onion, he explains how in virtualization, you went from agents to backing up a, 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 a VMware instance, a virtual instance. What's different about containers? What makes modern what constitutes modern data protection for containers? Yeah, so, so I think the story that Danny tells as well is, so when we had, we had our physical agents and virtualization came along and a lot of, and this is really where Veeam was born, right? We went into the virtualization API, the VMware API, and we started leveraging that to be more storage efficient. The admin overhead around those agents weren't there then. We could just back up using the API. Whereas obviously a lot of our competition would use agents still and put that resource overhead on top of that. So that's where Veeam initially got the, the kickstart in that, in that world. I think it's very similar to when it comes to Kubernetes because K10 is deployed within the Kubernetes cluster and it leverages the Kubernetes API to pull out that data in a more efficient way. You could use image-based backups or traditional NAS-based backups to protect some of the data, but and backups kind of the, it's only one of the ticks in the boxes, right? You have to be able to restore that and know what that data is. But oh, wait, your competitors aren't as fat, dumb, and happy today as they were back then, right? So can't they use the same APIs? And yeah. So what makes you guys different? 
So I think that, that's testament to the Kubernetes and the community behind that. And things like the CSI driver, which enables the storage vendors to um, take that CSI abstraction layer and then integrate their storage components, their snapshot technologies, and other efficiency models in there, and be able to um, leverage that as part of the, a universal data protection API. So really, that's, that's one tick in the box, and you're, you're absolutely right. There's open source tools that can do exactly what we're doing to a degree on that backup and recovery. Where it gets really interesting is the mobility of data and how we're protecting that. Because as much as stateful workloads are seen within the Kubernetes environments now, they're also seen outside. So things like Amazon RDS, and, but the front end lives in Kubernetes going to that stateless point. But being able to protect the whole application and being very application aware means that we can capture everything and restore wherever we want that to go as well. Like, so uh, the demo that I just did was actually a Postgres database in AWS and us being able to clone or migrate that out into an EKS cluster as a stateful set. So we're, again, we're not leveraging RDS at that point, but it gives us the freedom of movement of that, that data. Yeah, I want to I talk about that, what you actually demoed. One of the, one of the interesting things uh, we were talking earlier, um, I didn't see any CLI when you were going through the integration of, uh, of uh, K10 V5 in V12. Yeah. That, that, that was very interesting. But I'm always skeptical of this concept of the single pane of glass and how useful that is. Who is this integration targeting? Are you, are you, are you targeting um, the sort of traditional Veeam user who is now um, adding as a responsibility the management of protecting these Kubernetes environments? Or are you at the same time targeting the current owners of those environments? Because I know you talk about shift left, and uh, yeah. you know, no, nobody needs Kubernetes if you only have one container and one thing you're doing. So at some point, it's all about automation, it's about blueprints, it's about getting those things in early. So, so you get up, you talk about this integration, who cares about that kind of integration? Yeah, so I think, I think it's a bit of both, right? So we're definitely focused around the DevOps focused engineer, let's just call it that, and under an umbrella, the cloud engineers that's looking after Kubernetes from an application delivery perspective. But I think more and more as we, as we get further up the mountain, sysadmins, obviously who we speak to, the tech decision makers, the, the solutions architects, systems engineers, they're going to inherit and be that platform operator around the Kubernetes clusters. And they're probably going to land with the, the requirement around data management as well. So the, the, the specific VBR centralized management is very much for the backup admin, the infrastructure admin, or the cloud-based engineer that's looking after the, the Kubernetes cluster and the data within that. Still, we speak to app developers who are conscious of what their database looks like because that's an external data service. And, the, the biggest question that we have or the biggest conversation that we have with them is that the source code, the GitHub or the source re repository, that's fine, that'll get, your, that'll get some of the way back up and running. But when it comes to a Postgres database or some sort of data service, well, that, that's out of the, the CI CD pipeline. So it's whether they, they're interested in that or whether that gets farmed out into another, the operations, the traditional operations team. So I want to unpack your press release a little bit. It's full of all the acronyms, so maybe you can help us uh, uh, sure. decipher. You got security everywhere, uh, enhanced platform hardening, including KMS, that's key, yeah, management, key management services. Assist, yeah. System, okay. With AWS, KMS, and HashiCorp, Vault, awesome, love to see Hashi, hot company. Yeah. Um, RBAC objects in UI dashboards, ransomware attacks, AWS, S3. So anyway, security everywhere. What do you mean by that? So I think traditionally at Veeam, and, and continue that, right, in that in, from a security perspective, if you think about the failure scenario, and ransomware is the hot topic, right, when it comes to security, but we can think about security as, if we think about that as the bang, right, the bang is something bad's happened, fire, flood, blood type stuff. And we tend to be that right-hand side of that. We tend to be the, the remediation. We're definitely the one, the last line of defense to get stuff back when something really bad happens. And I think what we've done from a K10 point of view is not only in, in, enhance that, so with the likes of being able to, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Let's use the services that HashiCorp have done from a HashiCorp Vault point of view and integrate from a key management system. But then also things like um, S3 or ransomware uh, prevention. So 
I want to know if something bad's happened. And Kirsten actually did something more generic from a Theme 1 perspective. But one of the pieces that we've seen since we've then started to send our backups to an immutable object storage is let's be more of that left as well and look, start looking at the preventative tasks that we can help with. Now, we're not going to be a security company, but you, you heard all the way through Danny's like, keynote and probably when he's been on here, is that it's always, um, we're always mindful of that, that security focus. So the, on that point, what was being looked for? A spike in CPU utilization that would be associated with encryption? Yeah, exactly is, that. Is that, so, is that what was so that could like be, that? Yeah, exactly that. So that could be from a virtual machine point of view, but from a K10, and it specifically is that we're going to look at the S3 bucket or the object storage, and we're going to see if there's a rate of change that's out of the out of the normal. It's not, it's an anomaly, and then with that we can say, okay, that doesn't look right. Alert us through observability tools that again around the cloud native ecosystem, Prometheus, Grafana. Um, and then we're going to get insight into that before the bang happens, hopefully, before the so bang happens. So that's an interesting when we talk about adjacencies and moving yep. into this area of security. We're talking to Zeus about that, too. Exactly. That's that sort of creep where you can actually add value. It's interesting. So, okay, so we talked about shift left, get that, and then expanded ecosystem, uh, industry leading technologies. By the way, one of them is the Red Hat marketplace. And I think I, think I heard Anton's. Anton was amazing. He, is the head of product management at Veeam. He's been to every Veeam on. Um, he's got family in Ukraine. He's based in Switzerland. Yeah. But he didn't. He chose not to come here because he's obviously supporting, you know, the carnage that's going on in Ukraine. Uh, but anyway, I think he said that the Red Hat team is actually in Ukraine developing, you know, while the bombs are dropping. That's amazing. But anyway, back to our interview here. Expanded ecosystem. Red Hat, SUSE with Rancher, they've got some momentum. vSphere with Tanzu, they're in the game. T talk about that ecosystem and its importance. Yeah, and I think, and it goes back to your point around the CLI, right, is that uh, the, it feels like the next stage of Kubernetes is going to be very much focused towards the operator or the operations team. The sysadmin of today is going to have to look after that. And at the moment, it's all very command line. It's all CLI driven. And I think the marketplace is OpenShift being our biggest foot, foothold around our, our customer base is definitely around OpenShift. Um, but things like, obviously, we're a long-standing alliance partner with VMware as well. So their Tanzu operations, actually there's um, support for TKGS, so um, vSphere, um, Tanzu Grid Services um, is another part of the big release of 5.0. What the, all three of those and the, the common marketplace gives us a UI, gives us a way of being able to see and visualize that rather than having to go and hunt down the commands and, and get, get our information through something. Oh, like some CTL. people are going to be unhappy about that. Uh, yeah. But I contend the human eye has evolved to see in color for a very good reason. <laughs> so exactly. I want to see things in red, yellow, and green at times. There you go, so, yeah. So when we hear a company like Veeam talk about, look, we have no platform agenda. We, we don't care which cloud it's in. We, we don't care if it's on-prem or Google Azure, AWS. We had, we had uh, uh, Wasabi on, we have, great. They got an S3 compatible yeah. you know, target and others as well. Um, when we hear them, companies like you talk about that's, that consistent experience and single pane of glass that you're skeptical of, maybe because it's technically challenging. Um, one of the things, we call it super cloud. Right? That's come up, Danny and I were riffing on that the other day. And we'll do that more this afternoon. But it brings up something that we were talking about with Zeus, Dave, which is the edge, right? And it seems like Kubernetes, and, and we think about OpenShift. Yeah. We were there last week at Red Hat Summit. That's like 50% of the conversation, if not more, was the edge, right? And really true edge, worst cases, we're, we're, uh, use cases. Two weeks ago, we were at Dell Tech. There was a lot of edge talk, but it was retail stores like Lowe's. Okay, that's kind of near edge, but the far edge, we're talking space, right? So it seems like Kubernetes fits there and OpenShift, you know, particularly, as well as some of the others that we mentioned. What about edge? Um, how much of what you're doing with container data protection do you, do you see as informing you about the edge opportunity? Are you seeing any patterns there? Nobody's really talking about it in data protection yet. So so yeah, large scale numbers of these very small clusters that are out there on farms or in wind turbines, and, and, and that is definitely something that is being spoken about. There's not much mention actually in this 5.0 release because we actually support things like K3S 
EKS Anywhere. That all came in 4.5. So, but I think to your first point as well, David, is that look, we, don't, we don't really care what that Kubernetes distribution is. So you've got K3S lightweight um, Kubernetes distribution. We support it because it uses the same native Kubernetes APIs, and we get, we get deployed inside of that. I think where we've got these large scale and large numbers of, of edge, uh, edge deployments of Kubernetes and they require potentially some data management down there and they might want to send everything in to a centralized location or a, a more centralized location than a farm shed down, out, on the, out, out in the country, um, I think we're going to see a big number of that. But then we also have um, our multi-cluster dashboard that gives us the ability to centralize all of the control planes. So we don't have to go into each individual K10 deployment to manage those policies. We can have one big um, centralized management multi-cluster dashboard, and we can set global policies there. So if you're running a database, and maybe it's the same one across all of your different edge locations, well, you could just set one policy to say, I want to protect that data on an hourly basis, a daily basis, whatever that needs to be, rather than having to go into each individual one. And then send it back to that central repository. So that's the model that you see. You don't see the opportunity, at least at this point in time, of actually persisting it at the edge. So I think it depends. Um, I think we see both. And, but again, that's the footprint. And maybe, like you mentioned about up in space, having a Kubernetes cluster up there, you don't really want to be sending up a NAS <laughs> device or a storage device, right, to have to sit alongside it. So it's probably, but then equally, what's the art of the possible to get that back mm. down to, to our planet like, yeah. as part of a consistent copy yeah. of data? Or even a farm or other remote locations. The question is, I mean, uh, EVs, you know, we're, we, we believe there's going to be tons of data. We just don't, and you think about Tesla as a use case, they don't persist a ton of their data. Maybe if a deer runs across you know, the front of the car, oh, persist that, send that back to the cloud. I don't want anyone knowing my Tesla data, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, there you go, that one too. All right, well, that's future discussion. We're still trying to squint through those patterns. I got so many questions for you, Michael, but we got to go. Thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. No Great worries. job on the keynote today and good luck. Thank you, thanks for having me. All right, keep it right there. We got a ton of product talk today. As I say, Danny Allen's coming back. We got, we got the ecosystem coming, a bunch of the cloud providers. Uh, we, we have, uh, well, iLand was up on stage. They were just recently acquired by 1111 Systems. They were an example today of a cloud service provider. We're going to unpack it all here on theCUBE at VeeamOn 2022 from Las Vegas at the Aria. Keep it right there. <laughs>